one of the things that you mention is that When a couple goes into therapy, it's about the relationship. It's about the two people and how those two people mesh into one complete unit. And like when you set expectations for couples, how do you balance them not, them wanting you to take their side or wanting to resolve the situation? How do you make it about them, about the we and not about me? I think there are a lot of questions I would ask would guide them into coming to this understanding that, oh, we have to work together. It's not just about me. It's about us. I think this mentality sometimes, especially during emotional moments, like It's just about me. It's about me. So that kind of triggers even more conflict. So I think the first step to guide them in the process, guide them into the process of going to, oh, this is about us. It's not just about one person is basically an intervention to help them, you know, be a team instead of being enemies. Mm -hmm. When you first start setting values and expectations for a couple who are going in for marital issues or relational issues, I'm curious about whether or not you talk to them about monogamy and about having multiple partners when you're setting expectations and trying to establish values. Is that something that you talk about in the beginning? Sometimes people have this misconception of what couples therapy is and who is it for but i see all different types of couples and so these things it's for the couple to decide like what they want to talk about what is okay like what are the ground rules of their relationship instead of me kind of posing on them what they should aim for it's for them to come together like to decide what kind of relationship they want what is considered cheating what is considered like monogamy like all these different terms it's not that i don't define them it's for the couple to define them Mm. when when you talk about defining health in a relationship where do you sort of step in when something is unhealthy where do you draw the boundary I think if it's, if we're talking about like conflicts, how Mm -hmm. the couple handles their resolution, then it's, it's easier. I would approach in a way that in the order of present, past and future. So what I meant by that is I observe and watch like their interaction and ask more questions and to see what it's like at home. And then I serve as a mirror to reflect back that information and point out the the unhealthy, the unhealthy patterns, the negative cycles that's going on in their communication. And then I do some work with the collecting history, how each partner has developed the way they handle conflicts, handle emotions. For example, like childhood experiences, past relationship experiences. And then I would guide them into gaining more understanding. This serves the purpose like for me to get a bigger picture and then for the partner who's sharing to gain more insight, how how they get to where they're at now. And then for the partner to be more understandable, possibly have more empathy toward the the person across from them. And then next step is the future. So we know what's going on right now, how we have come here. And the next step would be, "Mm, where do you wanna go next? I think this part, like in terms of approaching what's healthy, what's unhealthy in terms of conflict resolution i would approach it that way but then i think if other things like more personal more unique what is healthy what's unhealthy again i go back to the couple like for them to define that
It's interesting to me how as an individual therapist, you have to take inventory of both of their their histories because your goal is to understand and to empathize for them to empathize with one another, but to also bring that into the room and into the space. One of the things I've heard about couples therapy and one of the things that are often mentioned in classes or when people research it is couples therapy is often not a space to keep people together, but for the couple to decide whether or not they want to stay together. Can you speak more on that? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the first things I bring up in our first like session. There are the benefits of couples therapy for you to <clears throat> learn more skills, strengthen your relationship, but there are also, there's also the risk that through couples therapy, you find out, you know, this is not working or they have changed their mind about each other. So yeah, I have worked with couples who came in for a proper breakup because saying goodbye is something that is not taught by school or like parents. So some couples, they utilize the space to reflect back on like their relationship, what they have learned, what they appreciate of each other, and then have a proper goodbye. So couples therapy, it's not just for one type of couples. Mm. I wrote down what you said. We often don't learn how to say goodbye. And how do you manage the expectations of a couple? And by that, I mean, oftentimes in American society or just the way that society has adapted from getting private practice clients, we, we see people who have this vision of what marriage is that oftentimes you are together, you're together for around 50 to 60 years and then something happens and your expectation of that partner is broken. How do you manage the change and adaptability of that goodbye, of a possible divorce, of helping a couple come to that conclusion. Yeah, it, it's hard. It's very hard. Even like when I do couples therapy now, it's through telehealth. I can feel their emotions through the screen. Wow. Um, yeah. So I think the first step is just to give the space like to normalize all the emotions that each partner is feeling and validate acknowledge those feelings and there's no rush to achieve like something like for that moment but to just be okay with those feelings because mm. i think if in therapy if we don't Properly, you manage our feelings. We all know they're gonna come back to haunt us one day. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that is that might take a little time for each partner to process to be just okay enough, not completely okay, just okay enough with mm -hmm. their feelings. And the next step would be kind of set some short-term goals for each person because long-term is again is hard so let's just focus on some short-term things that you would like to achieve mm. jesse there's so much gold in what you said the reason why i say that is because you talk about properly managing feelings and i previously had Jia Jia chen come on the show and one of the things that she talked about is healing is like an onion. It's nonlinear because the moment that you scratch the surface on one event, you gain a deeper understanding of another layer that might have hurt you in the past. Can you explain what okay enough means in therapy? What does, a, what does enough mean when you're resolving this like, oh, we're going to break up, we're going to get divorced, etc.? How do you get, how do you know that a client is okay enough? in the process way is to i know i always go back to the client like what is okay enough for you like some people would want to 
their daily functioning. Some people want to not feel this feeling for too long. So again, it's back to that person. What does okay and not mean for you? Because you want to set something up for yourself that's achievable. Like I think if okay enough means that yes, you still feel the heartache, but you can take care of yourself, take care of the things that you're supposed to do, then maybe that is okay enough for you. Hmm. How do you control the emotion that you feel through the screen as a therapist? I, I, I take a couple of deep breaths for myself, but then <laughs> I think as a therapist, like as a, even a supervisor, I mm -hmm. always encourage my associates to, you know, it's okay to feel that way with your clients. Like, you're on this journey with them and as long as you can kind of go back to your life like after a session just be there with them help them hold the emotions provide that space there's no rush to feel anything any better very soon because mm. you know can you imagine like you're just in a session with your clients for 50 minutes and your client needs to hold those emotions for much longer time. So just be there with them. Mm. You've mentioned rushing through the process a few times. How do you that? How do you know that a couple is rushing the process? When they kind of choose to like, oh, what's next? What's next? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to feel this anymore. Like, what can I do? Is there anything I can do right now? So I don't feel this way. I think mm -hmm. it's, I think it's normal that when you're experiencing something like a negative emotion, you want to have it be over as soon as possible. But then that is the moment I would like kind of guide them, like taking deep breaths, doing some mindfulness that it doesn't have to be that bad. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that bad. And sometimes the client does hold the emotion far longer than we hold it as a therapist for 50 minutes. Oh, Another follow-up question I wanted to ask you. There's so much information out there about attachment and how attachment can really affect you as an individual. And with the overconsumption of information, people can often self-diagnose themselves and their own relational issues. How do you manage that in the room when someone feels so broken because of all this information that they've just learned about themselves in their own work. Yeah, there, there is a lot of information out there. I think as a therapist, it's just to provide the space for the clients to bring in whatever they have learned. And we have a conversation like, yes, you watch this video and you learn about this but that how does that apply to you like let's talk about that which part you resonate with and have a conversation about it and just to not just oh this is me is to really have the process to talk about it i think that process is very powerful and usually with that our support like usually clients who see oh okay maybe i'm not totally like that or <laughs> oh this part like resonate with me but that part is not me so it's important to have that conversation if someone is interested in getting couples therapy and they're still looking for the right therapist for them can you recommend any tools or any things that they can do while in the waiting process are there any relational tools that you that are like basics 101 for a couple. 
Yes, my go-to is active listening. I Ooh, think. What is active listening for people that don't know? Yeah, active listening means if you're talking to someone, you are really listening to them and not like too eager to say what you want to say, but just listen to the other person. And a lot of times, I think it's important to have a follow up and ask the other person, "Did I hear you right? What I heard is this, this, this." And then the other person can correct you if you didn't hear you, you didn't hear them right, because a lot of times. You might think you hear them right, but you don't. So that's the very first step. And I think active listening is very, very important because there's so many couples come in to couples therapy, and they will say, "I just want to feel heard." Like I don't think he or she is listening to me. Like it's so common, and. I think it's fascinating how we teach children to listen, but then as adults, we don't listen like to each other <laughs> that much anymore. So, like, kind of going to like you said, the one-on-one, like very basic active listening, and then I think it's also once you're able to actively listen to each other, it kind of magically like helps with the next step because when a partner feels heard. They might not need to be like as emotional to like wanting the other person to understand. Like they might go, "Oh, you know, my partner is listening to me, so I feel cared, I feel heard. So let me try to calm down, and then let me try to really express like what what my where did I what was triggering for me. So I think it's just the very first step, but very, very powerful first step for whatever that needs to be built upon that.、Mm. It's so simple, isn't it? Just the act of listening to a person has the powerful effect of just loving, loving them in a deeper way. And when you say that. I'm feeling an emotional response because even you talking about the power of listening, sometimes the most simple things are the most complicated things, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. My grandma used to say to me growing up when she used to tell me, "Go find the cheese." <laughs> It's like, "Go get cheese," and I couldn't find the cheese, so I would come to her and I would say, "Grandma, I can't find the cheese." She would say, "You have two ears and one mouth." Use your ears, and she said. You also have two eyes and one mouth. <laughs> she said, <laughs> "There's a reason why we have two of those things because you should talk less, listen, and see more." And、mm-hmm. I think that when you talk about listening, I remember having this really big epiphany in college where I actually sat down and and took a class on listening. And one of the things the professor said to me was body language. Is often another way of listening to the person, because they might not feel comfortable telling you all that's in their heart. But if you watch for how they say things, are they looking you in the eye? Are they hearing you? Those are often the things that tell you or indicative of whether or not they're really sharing their truth, because the truth hits different.、Mm-hmm. I think the nonverbal cues they are as powerful as. The words. I think it's important to pay attention. Like, is your partner like kind of showing some body language? Is feeling like that? Like, it's another way to understand like where they are coming from. So, yeah, definitely, that is very important. Are there any tools that you've taught your clients in therapy that have benefited you by teaching them? Yeah. I have this activity that I have, you know, that I have most of my clients do, like at the beginning of treatment, is to engage in the embrace, like hold each other, face each other, hold each other, and then tell, tell us, tell partner what they see in front of them. Some see. Some would say, "Oh, the the chair, the kitchen, or whatever," and then the other person will repeat what they have heard, and then vice versa. That is to help them understand 
they're in a room, same room that they are pretty familiar with, but then they still see different things. And wow. that applies to you're in an intimate relationship. You, you still like see different things in the relationship and values different things. And the only way to find out is to listen to each other. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think that is a pretty powerful um, <laughs> activity. I'm an, em <laughs> I'm an empath, so I feel <laughs> things very deeply. So when you <laughs> describe that story, I thought of my parents. I thought of my parents. They're, they're celebrating almost 30 plus years together. And when you talk about that activity, they're currently taking dance class together. And mm -hmm. so they're, they're in the same room, but they're looking at different, different parts. And when you talk about that activity, it reminds me of dancing that often, <laughs> oftentimes <laughs> when you're dancing, you're seeing a different perspective, but you're moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so life is like a dance and life is intimate. Mm -hmm. Can you speak about, because this, this has my mind rolling about what really matters in relationship, being seen, being heard, really understanding and knowing one another. And so what are some of the things that some couples go in thinking are the most important, but are often not the most important in a relationship? That's a very good question. I think, yeah, the, the most common one would be some couples wanting a quick fix. Like we have a problem, let's just fix it and get over with it. Mm. But then it's not just, it's not just one problem. It's always like many layers to it so i think it's important for the couple to have some patience to look at how what contributed to the problem and what are some of the patterns the history and in order to prevent similar problems happening again you need to have some changes you can't just operate the same way otherwise the same problem will come up again. Yeah. How do you, how do you make sure that a problem doesn't happen again in couples? What are some of the things that you do to help resolve that for them? Yeah. I think, for example, like conflict resolution, like after giving them tools for them to make changes, then I really put it back on them. It, it's really up to you. You can keep practicing the tools and keep having changes, or you can go back to the way you communicated or problem solved before. Um, I think motivation is very important, like to help the couple in terms of which direction they're going to go. So. It's not a thing that can be resolved like 100% in couples therapy. It's the maintenance. It's the work that you continuously have to put into in order to have the changes maintained. Are there any resources or books that couples can use to increase their knowledge of couples therapy? I think not necessarily couples therapy, but then there's another thing I have a lot of my couples do. It's just go take the love language test. Ooh. The five languages of love, quality time, gifts, acts of service, physical touch, and verbal affirmation. It's very simple. It doesn't take you much time, but then you really get to know what your love language is. And then I think some people like what they offer and what they want to receive is different. So this is a very simple thing, but I think again, it's a very powerful tool. And when you find out the result, you can have 
like a conversation with your partner. Like, oh, I feel the most loved when you spend quality time with me. And then what, what are, what is your love language? How do you feel loved the most? And I think that gives each partner more understanding, like how to show love. When, when a couple goes in and both of them have had some level of trauma, because you speak about love language, and let's say that one person's love language is physical touch, and another person's la- love language is acts of service. And oftentimes those two things, for the acts of service person, they might be uncomfortable, let's say, because they've been through some sort of sexual trauma or some sort of relational trauma. How do you help a couple resolve that, especially if physical intimacy is really important for for a couple? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is very hard. I think I would really encourage the partner who has trauma history to be in their individual therapy, because like going back to couples therapy. The client being the unit, the relationship, like there, there's the limitation to how much time, how much space we can help this individual with their trauma. So it's very important that they have their individual therapy to discuss, to process. And then in couples therapy, I think the main thing would be helping the other partner, like know how to help this partner who has like trauma history. I guess it, it's important to include them in the process, not just like, oh, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But to like, oh, if you do this, I feel that way. So can you do this instead of that? Like be again, like teamwork. And then for the partner who has trauma history to express themselves like let them let the other partner know how they want to be helped and that's also very important we've gotten a lot of inquiries about red flags in couples therapy why my partner doesn't want to go to couples therapy with me in closing this i want to honor some of the listeners and some of the people that have followed Yellow Chair Collective because there are some people who really think that they would benefit for couples therapy, but they have a partner that might not be ready to start doing this work. And so Mm -hmm. do you have any advice for partners that might just be struggling emotionally because they they feel like they would benefit, but their partner isn't ready for therapy? I've gotten quite a number of consultation calls of people just calling like i i really want couples therapy but my partner's re- not ready my partner doesn't believe in couples therapy what should i do and i think to maybe have the partner consult with a professional like you know let the professional tell the partner what couples therapy is maybe the partner doesn't have the correct information like what couples therapy is so i think that's one thing a person who wants couples therapy can try and then the other thing is while you are waiting for your partner to be interested um, it's a good idea to have your own individual therapy to see like your contribution into like what's going on in the relationship. And I think even though it, individual therapy is hard to work on like relationship, relationship things, but then I'm sure the therapist can give the person like some tools to try in terms of active listening, communication skills. I think like that can be discussed in individual therapy as well. So. Once they learn those tools, they can bring that into their relationship. And maybe by them practicing those skills, those tools, the partner would be like, oh, I do see some differences like that you have brought in. Maybe couples therapy can even like bring in more stuff. So 
think yeah. those are my recommendations. Yeah. So lead by example, over communicate, provide them with the best resources so that the partner gets the most information, but also take care of yourself in the process is what I'm hearing you say, right? You should also yes. do your own work. Yes. Yeah. What, what is one piece of advice you want to go off on? For people that are listening, they're like, oh, I really like Jessie. She has such a calming presence and she taught me a lot today. What's, what's something that you want to encourage people to do in this cultural moment, given everything that's happened, given all of the information that we've talked about today? Relationship is hard. Mm. I think it's one of the most challenging things like that we have to do. But you're not alone. I, I don't think there are that many perfect relationships out there. It's all these like good relationship requires work, requires a lot of intention. So you're not alone if you're struggling with relationship issues because we we were not taught in school and we often just learn from our parents or other adult figures how to handle relationship issues and a lot of times they were not the best examples so in, if you have a relationship you want to be in and the certain type of relationship that you want to have it's doable. It just takes some time, takes some effort, and it's achievable. Thank you so much, Jesse. I took like three pages of notes today because of you. I always have so much to learn, especially when it comes to couples, because I don't specialize. So thank you so much for your time. And this is going to really serve people. Thank you for having me.